This is video number 1000 on the channel. It's been a long time coming, but I'm happy we're here, and I want to take us back to one thing we've done a lot here, which is challenge some of the things happening with our regulators, like the US SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, through events that we've seen happening in the courtroom, like the SEC versus Ripple or SEC versus Library, other cases they've taken up against Coinbase, Gary Gensler's appointment as the chair. All of these things have happened since we've been doing this, and it certainly has highlighted that the SEC is not really in a great place, and they certainly are not acting with the investor's interest at heart. So for our thousandth video on the channel, I want to take a look at Hester Peirce's most recent dissent on a denial of a request to amend some rulemaking, which sounds like it might be a pretty boring topic, and uh, ultimately it, it may be, but really, uh, the thing I want to dive into here is how the SEC is not taking into consideration what's really best for the investors here, and we'll look at how and why, and uh, maybe a quick look back on the channel itself to celebrate this milestone, but if we haven't met before, my name's Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. 2020 is the year that we started the channel in September, so I just want to take a quick look back in time before we dive into it. So here's some of the older videos. So if you go to the channel page and sort the videos on date, you can see this was the first one I did when actually making this a channel. I actually had a 14-year-old video now. Uh, here of me doing a stand-up set in college. If that's something that you, you're interested in. That was my oldest video before starting the channel here. We've done a lot of topics on uh, personal finance, from uh, how to opt out of being solicited to. Uh, we talked about stimulus checks way back. We talked about books and finance and how you could uh, you know, buy a car online, all sorts of topics. Uh, but then we made a more gradual shift talking more about uh, Bitcoin and then other cryptos as well. And then uh, we've really focused in on XRP, especially as we were looking at the SEC's lawsuit against Ripple, the company. But now let's kind of uh, fast forward to where we are here. It's 2024, if you can believe that. We're almost four years into the channel. The SEC versus Ripple case hadn't even started when the channel started but now we're still ongoing with it having begun in December of 2020, a couple of months after starting this. And then we look here and the SEC is still not quite on the same page as the investors that they're supposedly trying to protect. So has your purse, one of five SEC commissioners. She is a Republican, two out of the five. Gary Gensler is not, obviously, with his buddies, uh, the Clintons, uh, Elizabeth Warren and others. And uh, here we have a case of Hester Peirce publishing a dissent on something that happened. So she's not in agreement with what they did at the SEC. This was published today, January the 30th, 2024. And uh, in this, she's saying that she dissents uh, the commission's denial of a petition to amend a certain rule, the so-called gag rule. Now, this de facto rule of the SEC follows from the commission's enforcement of its policy that was adopted way back in 1972 that it will not permit a defendant or respondent to consent to a judgment or order that imposes a sanction while denying the allegations in the complaint or order for the proceedings. In that same policy, though, the SEC articulated its belief that a refusal to admit the allegations is equivalent to a denial unless the defendant or respondent states that he neither admits nor denies the allegations. These two strands, the refusal to settle with persons who deny the allegations and the belief that refusing to admit is a denial, converge in the same requirement that to settle with the commission, a person must either, one, admit the allegations underlying the commission's enforcement action, or two, state that she neither admits nor denies the allegations. To compel compliance with the no-deny prong of the policy, the SEC requires settling defendants to agree that they will not take any action or make or permit to be made public or to be made any public statement denying directly or indirectly any allegation in the complaint or creating 
the impression that the complaint is without factual basis and also will not make or permit to be made any public statement to the effect that the defendant does not admit the allegations of the complaint or that this consent contains no admission of the allegations without also stating that defendant does not deny the allegations and the commission further requires the settling defendant to withdraw any papers filed in the action to the extent that they deny any allegations in the complaint. And finally, the SEC's mandatory language states that if defendant breaches this agreement, the commission may petition the court to vacate the final judgment and restore the action to its active docket. The net result is that the settling defendant for the action to stay settled, and this is the most important part of this, must agree both to rescind her past in-court statements contesting the truth of the commission's allegations and promise never again to contest the truth of the commission's allegations herself or even permit others to contest the allegations. So this is a problem. The SEC, if you're going to settle and have the SEC not come after you any further, we've seen some of these settlements earlier uh, against other crypto companies like uh, Kraken or uh, even if we go back a little bit further, uh, BlockFi, with massive penalties, as part of this settlement, you have to say or take back anything that you said in the case uh, saying that the SEC's allegations were based in fact, and then also you have to promise to never again contest the truth of the SEC's allegations. So this is really an issue when you're thinking about trying to get to, one, the truth, and two, actually protect protecting investors, which is what the SEC is supposed to be doing. If you can't uh, make any kind of accusation or even, you know, allege that the SEC might not have 100% of the truth on their side, then certainly uh, it puts the SEC up on a pedestal that they certainly don't belong on. So that's that's what she's objecting to here. And she's going to give some examples. I'm not going to go through everything in, in full detail here, but I just want to give you that as background along with the language. So you can see that, you know, when this policy was adopted back in 1972, it had a brief statement explaining why it needed it to um, avoid creating or permitting to be created an impression that a decrees being entered or a sanction imposed when the conduct alleged did not, in fact, occur. Now, that could be theoretical, and even if real, the policy adopted isn't the right way to protect the commission's reputation. Now, back way in the 70s, you know, they had devoted significant resources to their enforcement program. They wanted to, you know, prop this up and make it seem as though it was without um, reproach. And these uh, kinds of requirements certainly did that. Now, when we're thinking in current days, as you want more of the truth to come out, you want to be able to have things in the court and you want these records to be out there so that people can see when the SEC comes after them that others have had similar issues, but, uh, it, you know, it just gets buried in a settlement. You want those things to be out there. You want those items to, you know, make their way to the light of day. But the SEC operates best in darkness, it appears, when it comes to their enforcement actions, trying to keep these things kind of uh, under the radar and certainly not let these get out. Now, I'll continue here with what... Um, Mr. Bruce is arguing, apart from the scant factual basis for the commission's given reason for needing the no-deny policy, it should be re-examined because a regulatory policy that prevents people from speaking against government action necessarily raises First Amendment concerns. Prohibiting a person from taking any action to make any public statement that the complaint is without factual basis is a plain prior restraint on speech. So she's arguing that in so doing here, the SEC is going against the First Amendment of the Constitution, which guarantees free speech. And so if they're not allowed to make any of these statements, if they're actually barred by the court, it certainly exacerbates the problem of uh, restraining uh, free speech because of this court outcome, but also just the reputation of the SEC. You know, they are not coming across well when they're trying to keep the truth from getting out there. So the mismatch between the commission and most defendants in its enforcement actions carries through to the settlement process, even when the disparities in bargaining power between the commission and the defendant are less pronounced in some of the cases we've seen, the no-deny clause is a mandatory non-negotiable term. 
The SEC admits as much in its denial letter in the example here. The policy binds the enforcement staff. The commission will not agree to a settlement unless the defendant agrees not to publicly deny the allegations in the complaint. So the SEC is certainly in the position of power here because they are that agency backed by the government that can make your life miserable if you're a a person or entity that uh, has come in their crosshairs. So this is why she's dissenting and why I think there should be more questions around what's actually happening at our agencies. And we've seen some of this happen in more recent court cases like that EPA case that we've cited here multiple times, which has kind of challenged the Supreme Court itself, challenging the authority of regulators that doesn't directly come from Congress. Now, she's going to wrap it up here saying, because no admit, no deny settlements are the most common resolution of SEC enforcement actions, the rule at issue affects countless potential speakers. Given that all of these silent speakers have been on the wrong end of an enforcement action, we can assume that some might have negative things, whether accurate or not, to say about the government. The gravity of silencing this subset of people weighs heavily on me, she writes. Defenders of our policy might take comfort in the scope. After all, you can say bad things about the agency, just not about your settlement. To the contrary, the commission's mandatory language is so ambiguous as to only aggravate these concerns. And she gives some examples here. The commission's requirement that a defendant agree not to permit denials of the allegations in the complaint is equally problematic, though. This language suggests that defendants have an affirmative obligation to stop other people from saying things that might cast doubt on the complaint's allegations. Must a settling defendant stop her husband from posting on social media his disagreement with the charges in his wife's settlement with the commission? Must a defendant require subsequent employers to link to the settlement in the otherwise flattering profiles they post on their websites? Probably not, but the mandatory language nevertheless is troublingly nebulous. To obtain commission authorization to file an enforcement action in district court, the Division of Enforcement is required to submit to the commission an action memorandum that provides a comprehensive explanation of the factual and legal uh, foundation for the recommended civil action. The enforcement manual, however, does not require that the division include with that a copy of the court complaint. The petitioner is correct that reconsideration of the rule is a pressing matter that belongs on the current notice and comment rulemaking agenda, or if my colleagues have concluded our agenda is too packed with other projects, she writes, perhaps we can just drop the no-deny rule in the same unceremonious way we adopted it. So interesting. Uh, The SEC has a lot of things happening there that we probably disagree with, from the constant war on crypto to other actions they're taking as it relates to enforcement, to rulemaking or lack thereof, and then certainly some of these existing policies where they're trying to quash any kind of comment against them and certainly silence some of the people that they brought charges against. So let me know what you think. Will we actually see anything change here? A thousand videos in, are we going to see the SEC held to account and will they have to make some positive changes? Will we see anything different as we move through an election year? I'm curious to know what you think. As always, if you found any value here, drop a like. Like it helps channel a ton, helps me do this for another thousand videos. Hit that subscribe button so I can keep you up to date on all the latest news. Thank you so much for spending some time here with me. I do truly appreciate it. Have a fantastic rest of your day and I will see you in the next one.